Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. So um, today I want to uh, well talk about good value calculus and how it relates to well, calculating homotopy groups of spheres, essentially. So, uh, well, good value calculus is something I'm, uh, I'm very fond of. It's somehow, it's one of these ideas that applies very generally to lots of different situations, but when you specialize it to specific examples, it's still telling you something uh, really interesting. So it's somehow rare for ideas to have both of those features and good value calculus is definitely one of them. So I'm going to give a super brief uh, summary of what this is and then, and then mostly use it. So, all right. So, Goodly calculus is somehow about approximating functors by polynomial functors. So let me introduce a few words. So let's say that I had a functor f from pointed spaces uh, to itself. So this is the notation I was using in the first talk as well for pointed spaces. I'm going to say that such a functor is linear if it is of the following form. So if it is of the form f of a pointed space is um, loops infinity of some spectrum e smashed with x, smashed with the suspension spectrum of x, uh, like so, all right? So for some spectrum e. So you could summarize this a different way. Is, is F behaves like a homology theory, okay? So F is a homology theory, or maybe a slightly more accurate statement would be the homotopy groups of F form a homology theory. I mean, saying that your functor has this form in particular says that you will have uh, excision for the homotopy groups of F. All right, so that's the notion of a linear functor, and similarly, you could say what it means to be homogeneous of degree N. So linear being homogeneous of degree one. Okay, so F is N homogeneous if it is of the following form. F of X is loops infinity of now, well, expression looks like this. I take x and I take it to the nth power. That certainly seems like a reasonable feature for n homogeneous functors. And I'm going to also allow, well, not me, I mean, it's good release theory, allow taking orbits by the, the symmetric group. So here, the symmetric group acts by permuting the copies of x, and it's also allowed to act on e. Right? So this is for a spectrum e. with sigma in action. All right, and this is all in the naive sense. There's no real equivariant homotopy theory going on here. So if you're thinking infinity categorically, you could think of this as an element of the, the functor category from B sigma n to spectra, or you could think of it as a parameterized spectrum over B sigma n or something like that. Um, just sigma in action in the, in the naivest way. Uh, one way to say this, this thing is, you know, you should think of this as F F being n homogeneous, you should think of as F behaving like a monomial of the following form, some constant times x to the n divided by n factorial, I'm taking the covariance corresponds to this, to this division. So if you're thinking the analogy with calculus and Taylor series, then this is, this is the correct analog for n homogeneous. Um, okay, so with these two things in place, I can say what it means to be polynomial of degree n. You can just define this inductively. Okay, so F is polynomial of degree n if uh, it fits into a fiber sequence. And if I want to be precise, I should, see, should say principal fiber sequence here. Principal fiber sequence of the following kind. Well, I want to say f is an extension of an n minus 1 polynomial functor by an n homogeneous one. OK, so I have f. I have some other functor G here, uh, and I have a fiber H. So here G is n minus one polynomial, or polynomial of degree n minus one, right? So I start my induction at the, at the linear functors, which are one poly, polynomial of degree one by definition. And this here is n homogeneous. Do you have a question? Yeah. 
uh, are you thinking of most of your orbits at the spectrum level or at the space level? At the spectrum level. So I take orbits first, then apply loops infinity. Okay. okay? All right. Okay, so these are the polynomial functors of degree n, uh, and the whole point is that, well, any functor can be approximated by such things. So here's a theorem. Do it to good, Willie. So let's say that uh, I have a functor from pointed spaces to itself, and let's assume that it is uh, reduced. So reduced just means it sends the point to the point or preserves contractible spaces. I'm assuming either this is a functor between infinity categories, or you could also do it on the one categorical level, but then at least you should require that this functor preserves weak equivalences for it to be a reasonable object of study here. Uh, okay, so it's reduced, preserves filtered colimits. Um, well, under these assumptions, there is always a universal map to a polynomial functor of degree n. So there is a universal, and here universal really means, well, initial up to homotopy. So there's universal map f to p and f into a polynomial functor of degree n. So in other words, this PNF is polynomial of degree n, and whenever I have a map from a natural transformation from f into some n polynomial thing, it will factor at least up to homotopy over PNF. Okay, so a consequence of this is I can look at these sort of polynomial approximations to f for all n together, and I can put them together into a tower. So the consequence is that I get a well, what's called the Goodwillie Tower of the functor. I mean, if you read Goodwillie's paper, you'll call this Taylor Tower. Um, but I mean the same thing. So this goes, oh, sorry. This goes from F to P1 of F. That's sort of the, the best linear approximation to F. And then there's a P2 of F and a P3 of F. And you get maps to all of these. Okay. All right. And uh, well, you could look at the uh, the successive well layers or the fibers in this tower. So I could take the fiber uh, of the map p n f to p n minus one f. So this fiber is usually denoted d n f. Uh, this is. Well, this is an n homogeneous functor. This fiber is exactly the difference between the universal n polynomial and the universal n minus one polynomial approximation. And this is of the so this is of the form that I had before. This standard form for n homogeneous functors. So it must be something like well, there must be some coefficient spectrum here, smash x to the n, and this coefficient spectrum is usually denoted partial n of f. Okay, and this partial n of f. So by definition, it's the coefficient spectrum that appears here, and it has a name, it's called the nth derivative of f. Um, right, so Goodwill calculus allows me to extract from such a functor f a sequence of spectra, partial n of f, where the nth one has an action of the symmetric group on n letters. And somehow these are encoding something about the functor f. They describe the homogeneous layers in this tower, if you will. Okay, so let me immediately specialize to the case that's, that's of interest today. It's the one where f is the identity functor of pointed spaces. All right, so let me abbreviate the notation a little bit. I'm going to use the following kind of notation. Um, so I could take Pn of the identity functor applied to a space X, and I'm simply just going to write this Pn of X, simply because I'm not going to be taking Pn of any other functor than the identity today. All right, so specializing this previous discussion, 
for x a pointed space, I will get a tower of spaces under x. Uh, so this looks something like this, p1x, p2x, p3x, etc. And uh, while well, this p1x uh, is definitely something familiar, in P1 of the identity, it should somehow be the universal approximation of the identity function of spaces by something that satisfies excision. Well, if you think about that for a second, you'll realize this can't be anything else than Q or loops infinity sigma infinity of X, right? So the universal sort of excisive approximation to the identity is stable homotopy. Okay, so you, you can think of this tower as something that, well, interpolates between X itself, so sort of the unstable homotopy type of X, and, well, what you could call the stabilization of X. So this is something that has as its homotopy groups the stable homotopy groups of X. Okay, so this Goodwillie tower is somehow a, a device that interpolates between stable and unstable homotopy. All right, so let me make a few remarks about this uh, tower. Um, First of all, uh, this tower has excellent convergence properties in the following sense. So this tower converges for nilpotent spaces. So by converging, I mean that the map from X into the limit, or the homotopy limit, of the PN X's uh, is an equivalence. Okay, so in particular, uh, this applies to simply connected spaces, right? Those are, those are nil potent. Um, the second one is um, that, well, not only does it converge, you can, you can say something about the, the rate of convergence, if you will. So actually the maps from X to PNX, they usually become very highly connected. So let me say it like this, if X is K minus one connected, then um, x to pnx uh, is an iso on pi t for t less than the following k times n plus one minus n. Okay, so if you think about the case n is one, this is essentially the Freudenthal suspension theorem, but this is telling you that as you increase n, uh, this connectivity, well, at least if you're talking about simply connected spaces, so that K is at least two, and this connectivity uh, actually grows linearly as you move up, okay? All right, um, statement two is essentially a consequence of statement one plus, you know, the calculation of the connectivity of the fibers. I'll say something about the fibers in just a second. All right, okay. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to talk about the layers of this tower. So in other words, I want to talk about the derivatives of the identity for a bit. So these derivatives of the identity functor were first uh, identified by uh, Brenda Johnson. Uh, and the formulation of a result that I'll give here is, is the one that was given by uh, Aron Mahold. Um, okay, so is the result. So it turns out the derivatives of the identity, well, there are some sequence of spectra with uh, symmetric group actions on all of them, and, and they can be described very explicitly in terms of some finite complexes here. So the theorem is the following. The nth derivative of the identity can be identified as the following finite spectrum. So I'll explain the notation in a second. There's going to be some space here, pi n, uh, which is going to be the nth partition complex. So I'll, I'll give a definition. Um, and then I have to, well, I have to suspend this space. It doesn't have a base point, so it's an unreduced suspension. So this is somehow in this business denotation, notation for unreduced suspension, this little diamond up there. I suspend it again. Um, and then, well, this is still a space. I have to extract a spectrum. And the way to do that is take the Spaniel Whitehead dual. So this check here, indicates the Spaniel Whitehead dual of this space, okay? All right, so this pi n, as I was saying, uh, it's, well, the nth partition complex, what is that? Um, it's the nerve of a certain uh, 
finite post set. So this pi n or the this the space, the simplicial complex associated to a, a certain post set. So what I do is I, I take the post set of partitions of an n element set. Okay, so this is the post set of um, proper and non-discrete partitions or equivalence relations on, if you will, the set uh, one up to n, right? So if you if you think of the set of all those partitions, that post set will have an initial and a final element, namely the so the trivial partition that bunches everything together and the discrete partition. So I'm removing those two, otherwise I would never have an interesting homotopy type anyway. Okay, so this is a post set. I could take its nerve, take a simplicial set, and then think of it as a space, as a simplicial complex. So that's what this space is, and it clearly has an action of the symmetric group just by permuting the letters. Okay, so that's what this pi n is. Uh, so this gives an explicit identification of these uh, derivatives of the identity, which turns out to have all sorts of uh, amazing consequences. And I'll try to explain uh, a few of those. Let me first start by just giving you a few examples uh, of what this thing looks like, okay? So pi two uh, is the easiest. Or maybe in the theorem I should have said this actually applies if n is at least two. Um, pi two, if you think about it, well, a two element set, it has only trivial and discrete partitions. So actually this thing, this space is empty. And then if you calculate D two of the identity, uh, you'll find that this is the minus one sphere, right? I mean, the point is I have to suspend the empty set that gives me S naught. Suspend again gives me S one, and then I have to dualize. And uh, this has the trivial sigma two action. All right, um, pi three, if you think about it, it actually looks like, as a sigma three space, well, it's a discrete space and it looks like sigma three mod sigma two. Okay, so it consists of three points and sigma threes acting on them in this way. Uh, pi four is already a bit more interesting. So I made a picture of it. It's some uh, one dimensional simplicial complex uh, that looks uh, more or less like this. Um, and well, you can figure out if you want that this actually is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of six circles, uh, although that identification doesn't really respect the, the, the group action. Uh, generally, you could say the following. So the homotopy type of these spectra is not so difficult to describe if you forget the symmetric group action for a second. So these post sets, uh, it's a bit like Tietz buildings for general linear groups. They're always just, you know, wedges of spheres. So uh, this is a wedge of n minus one factorial copies of the sphere spectrum in dimension one minus n. I guess this is not very readable. Do that again, one minus n. Okay, but this is this identification that I wrote is not compatible. I mean, it's not an identification of sigma n spectra. I mean, sigma n doesn't obviously act on the right hand side. So this is really only it does work if you restrict to uh, subgroup sigma n minus one. All right, so this is not the greatest way to think about these spectra because you really want to think of them as spectra with with the group sigma n acting. Another remark is. Um, well, the homology of these things you can identify pretty explicitly. So if you look at the homology of these spectra, then these are actually uh, sort of familiar, uh, familiar modules. Well, first of all, it has to be some free abelian group concentrated in degree one minus n, uh, but you can really describe the group action. This is actually um, the nth term of the Lie operat. Uh, thought of as an abelian group with uh, symmetric group action on it. Um, but there is, well, there's a, there's a twist of this sign. So this here is the nth term in the Lie operad, just thought of as an operad in abelian groups. And this here is the sign representation of sigma n, right? So, um, I mean, just as an abelian group, this is just a free abelian group of rank n minus one factorial, but this decomposition is telling you actually what the, what the group action really is. 
Okay, so this shows that there, well, already shows there is some connection between these Goodwilly derivatives of the identity and Lie algebras, um, which I'll probably not say too much about today, but this will also feature next time. Okay, it's an important hint. Um, okay, so that gives a description of these, the, the Goodwilly layers of the identity or these, uh, the homogeneous parts of this, of this tower. Uh, what I want to do now is, is zoom in a bit on just the bottom part of the tower and see what you already get there. So the stable part plus the next thing, P2. Uh, in other words, I want to zoom in a bit on the, on the metastable homotopy groups. So P1 of X encodes exactly the stable homotopy groups of X. And then if you take the first two stages together, so you look at P2 of X, uh, the homotopy groups of that are usually referred to as the, the metastable homotopy groups. Um, so it's the first step after, after stable. All right, so let me describe a, the uh, Goodwilly tower in this range a bit more explicitly. So here's a fact, which is not too hard to prove, but I want to actually prove it. Um, so let's consider this fiber sequence that defines the bottom of the tower. So in the fiber sequence, Uh, P2X going to P1X. Well, remember P1X was nothing else than Q of X. And as I said, well, the Goodwilly tower consists of principal vibrations. So I can, I can put the derivative on the other side, the cost of removing one of the loops. So here I can, I have to put the, the second derivative or the second homogeneous layer. And as I just said, the second derivative of the identity functor is actually the, the minus one sphere. So there's an S minus one here, smash. Uh, x squared h sigma 2 and sigma 2 is acting trivially on the minus 1 sphere so actually I, I get a little bit of cancellation here. I can just write this in this form. Um, and now this map here, let me label it. This map admits a uh, familiar description. Okay, so the map star uh, can be identified uh, with, now there are various standard names for this map. Sometimes it's called the SNAIF map with the SNAIF, uh, but it's also sometimes called the James Hopf map. So let me describe it for you. This map is adjoint to the following thing. So the, the construction I'll describe is very similar to how, how I described the James Hopf maps last time, but they arose from a splitting of sigma loop sigma x. Uh, these James Hopf maps are going to arise from a splitting of sigma infinity loops infinity, sigma infinity x. Okay, so this map star is adjoint to some map from sigma infinity loops infinity sigma infinity x to uh, sigma infinity of x squared. Or, homotopy co-invariance of that. So the way to get this thing is, let me move this a little bit. So use the fact that this also has a splitting. So this admits what's called snaith splitting. Um, you can decompose this as an infinite wedge of the extended powers of X. Okay, so there's a, a natural decomposition like this. And once I have that decomposition, I can just project onto the second sum end. So I can just go to sigma infinity x squared h sigma two. Okay, so again, it's the same principle as these other James Hopf maps, only using a different splitting. The adjunct to this map is this uh, sort of yellow uh, star map uh, and uh, I claim that, that this fiber sequence that I put up here actually describes this stage P2X uh, of the Goodwilly Tower. All right. Um, so that's something I'm going to I'm going to use. All right. So here's a little fact. Uh, let me make all this uh, more explicit. So let's zoom in on the case where X is a sphere, the N-sphere. Um, oops. 
then, um, well, I want to say something about uh, this term over here, right? I want to describe this one a bit more explicitly. The n sphere, that's not so hard. So, sigma infinity Sn smash Sn h sigma 2. Uh, well, if n were zero, this is just real projective space. Uh, if n is not zero, it's, it's a stunted projective space. So this is really sigma infinity of sigma n of rpn infinity, right? So where this rpn infinity denotes a stunted projective space. So this is rp infinity where you quotient out the n minus one skeleton. In other words, it's just, you know, it's like real projective space, but you start the cell structure only with, you put the bottom cell in dimension n, that's where you start. Um, so this thing is usually called a stunted projective space. Okay, if this identification is sort of new to you, then uh, it's, it's a good exercise to check, but it's not hard. Then here's a, a very useful observation, which I, uh, I don't know, I learned it from Nikun. Um, you can form the following uh, little diagram. So let's uh, take S1 uh, and take the n minus one fold suspension map going to loops n minus one of Sn. And now for both of these spaces, let's look at this bottom part uh, of the Goodwillie Tower. So this fiber sequence that defines P2. Okay, so for S1, uh, we have the stabilization map going to Q of S1, and then this continues via this James Hopf map to well, Q of S1 squared um, homotopy orbits. But by what I was just saying, that's the suspension of RP1 infinity. And I can do the same for Sn, and well, sort of uh, good really calculus will tell you that this, this diagram is going to commute. Uh, let me not say too much about that, but it's, it's easy to see. Uh, so here I get loops n minus one of uh, Q of Sn, that's the, the bottom of the tower for Sn. And here I get um, Q of, uh, oh, sorry, I'm forgetting some loops. Loops n minus one Q, and then there's, the nth suspension of this stunted projective space, like so. So this is a little commutative diagram. This is also the James Hopf map for Sn. And I'm going to take fibers in the horizontal direction. Okay, so if I take the fiber of this map here, uh, I pretty much get loops n Sn, but really I get only the connected component of the identity. So it's loops n zero of Sn. Uh, this map, uh, this guy over here, uh, this is actually just an equivalence, right? Um, so if I take the fiber here, I'm just going to get the point. And then if I take the fiber here, well, this thing here, I could just identify with Q sigma. I can just cancel some of the loops with some of the sigma here. It's this, uh, and well, you have to figure out what the horizontal map is, but I claim it's just the obvious, uh, well, the evident map between these spaces, the, uh, the quotient map. So the fiber of this is uh, Q of sigma of RP N minus one, if you think about it, all right? So that's what you get by taking horizontal fibers. So now here we have this little sequence of maps. Uh, well, I can reinterpret this as giving me a map from here into the loop space of this guy down here. So in other words, I get a map from here into Q, R, P, N minus one. And this map is also often called uh, the Snaith map. Uh, I mean, this map was originally constructed by maybe slightly different means, although it also used Snaith splittings and things like that. I mean, this map definitely predates, uh, you know, work on the Goodwillie Tower, but uh, I like this way thinking at, about it and looking at it. So the good thing about this map is um, actually it's compatible with the EHP sequence in the appropriate sense. So let me spell out what that means. So this map is compatible uh, 
with EHP. This is also uh, something that's originally due to Kuhn. Um, and what it's telling you is that you get a diagram of the following form. So we have loops n of Sn, or maybe this connected component of it. You can look at the suspension map uh, going into here, and then here I could put the Hopf map. Again, I'm, yeah, okay, working too locally, but um, well, it doesn't really matter at this stage. And then I have these snaith maps, okay? So here I have the snaith map going to Q of R, P, N minus one. Here I have the snaith map going to Q of R, P, N. And again, uh, well, it's sort of evident how to complete this fiber sequence to the right. I mean, here I should put Q, S, N, right? So really the, the bottom row is just loops infinity applied to the cofiber sequence RPN minus one, or rather it's stable version, sigma infinity of RPN minus one, sigma infinity RPN to SN, which is just the top cell of RPN. Really, so this bottom map here is just, just the inclusion of the N minus one skeleton of that, of that spectrum. And the claim is that this here, uh, that this here commutes. So a different way of saying the same thing is that's, uh, that this snaith map, um, so the snaith map sends uh, this filtration of QS naught by, by suspension. So it sends the E filtration of QS naught to the skeletal filtration of RP infinity. Or rather it's suspension spectrum. Okay. All right, so that's very nice. So the upshot of this is that you're actually going to get a comparison of spectral sequences here. We get a map from the EHP spectral sequence, which is the spectral sequence that you get by well, looking at the top row. Well, for all n, you have to put all these fiber sequences together. You get a map from that to uh, the well, the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence, which is the spectral sequence that arises from the skeletal filtration. Uh, the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence um, for uh, the stable homotopy groups of RP infinity. Um, Okay, so that's nice. And actually, well, we can, we can say, so how good this comparison is, uh, or at least uh, maybe to first approximation, because this map, uh, the one on the right, so this will tell me sort of how good this map is going to be on E1 pages. This map is already rather highly connected, right? This is an ISO on pi T uh, by, well, Freudenthal suspension for T going up to three N minus one. Uh, so that's that's already a pretty good range. So this this map of spectral sequences, um, this is an ISO on E1 uh, for t less than or equal to three n minus one. If I got it right. So this this whole game here, this comparison of spectral sequences, uh, this was really used to great effect by uh, Mahold. So Mahold studied this a lot and in great detail. So if you, uh, if you want to learn about this, then uh, his papers, like for example, image of J in the EHP sequence are really a, a great place to look. Um, well, of course, well, I should also say that this work on the whole definitely predates uh, all this stuff about the Goodwillie Tower. So I'm not presenting this in chronological order, but I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, I guess it's picture time. Let's look at some of these spectral sequences for a bit. So I've, again, more or less copied uh, this, this picture of the EHP sequence from last week. So that's up here. And what I've indicated in orange is this range in which this comparison to the T Hirsch spectral sequence is going to be good. And well, you'll see this is actually a pretty large range, right? I mean, of course, there's some stuff here that's outside of it, but this comparison is not bad at all. So you can really infer a lot of stuff about the EHP sequence from this T Hirsch spectral sequence. So, that one I've, I've put down here. Uh, so this is the at Airsworth spectral sequence for RP infinity. Um, well, I'm going to make several remarks about this, but 
for example, I've already drawn a little picture, which is kind of a picture of the stable cell structure of, of RP infinity. Of course, trying to understand this at the with spectral sequence is really, in a sense, that is trying to understand the cell structure of RP infinity, right? If you want to figure out what the differentials are in this at the with spectral sequence, then you have to figure out what all the attaching maps are and how far they, they factor through the skeleton of real projective space. Right, so you'll see that on each of the lines of this spectral sequence, you just get well the associated graded, which is the stable homotopy groups of spheres, and then somehow the attaching maps here are telling you how the differentials are supposed to go. So the differentials out of the diagonal are the are the easiest, and those well the easiest. I'm not saying it's super easy, but at least it's classical. This is the vector field problem I was talking about last week, and these attaching maps here, uh, they tell you how those uh, differentials go. Of course, that doesn't give you all differentials in the spectral sequence, but it's a place to start. And uh, well, Mahold has done very detailed calculations of this, of this spectral sequence. Um, I want to make some more remarks uh, about this thing here, but maybe let me scroll to the next page. So I've, what I've done here is I've depicted the same spectral sequence, but now from the E2 page onwards, this is a slightly more digestible picture. Uh, one reason is that, well, this thing is all two torsion is convenient. So every dot here just repent, uh, represents an F2 and I've sort of gotten rid of all the all the D1 differentials here. Otherwise it's it's mostly the same picture. Um, so let me make a couple of remarks uh, about this uh, spectral sequence and the comparison with EHP. So the first remark is uh, well as you can see um, this adherence for spectral sequence here already has all of these vector field differentials that we talked about last week. So those were the differentials out of the diagonal of the EHP sequence. And those are really all in this stable range as you can just check by doing the numbers. So all the vector field differentials And again, I've, mar I've marked them in yellow here like, like last week. So the vector field differentials in the EHP sequence these are lifted from this anterior spectral sequence. Also, one of the points I had in this theorem by James was that you could re-express this question about desuspending the whitehead bracket in terms of the cell structure of RP infinity. And that's exactly what's going on in this picture. This translation shows you, well, it's one way of showing you know, why that is. Um, so, okay, so these yellow differentials out of the diagonal are the, are the vector field ones uh, that you can also describe in terms of the J-homomorphism. Uh, the second remark, well, I guess I already made this one in, in words. So, so figuring out general differentials here in the spectral sequence uh, corresponds to, well, understanding the stable attaching maps of cells in RP infinity. I mean, that's just the nature of two years for spectral sequences. So again, I've, I mean, I have this diagram here on the right. So these, this picture is really saying something like, you know, that the two cell is attached to the one cell by a map of degree two. Here, the four cell is attached to the two cell by uh, along eta, and here there are also these longer. Oh, yikes! That's not what I wanted. There are also these longer extensions here that tell you that a certain attaching map actually factors through a much, much lower skeleton. And then once you cone off to the top cell of that skeleton, that attaching map looks like eta sigma. So this long attaching map eta sigma over here is exactly the one that's responsible for this this very long differential over here. Okay, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, another thing uh, to note about this spectral sequence is that, well, it's still somewhat chaotic, but you start to see some patterns, right? There's definitely periodicity going on in the spectral sequence. So for example, there's this little cluster that we also looked at last week already. There's this cluster of four differentials, which keeps repeating as you go down the spectral sequence. But also if you, if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see that and this sort of more chaotic looking bit actually gets repeated more or less over here. Uh, so there are things like that going on. So I want to, well, quickly say something about that periodicity. Uh, so this, call, this comes from something which in a sense is, well, geometric and uh, it's called James periodicity. So again, uh, 
James popping up. Um, so let me try to explain where this periodicity comes from. Um, so this goes in several steps. The first step is, uh, like with the EHP spectral sequence, you can truncate this Atiyah Hirsu spectral sequence. Right? So truncating, uh, let's say from the M line to the N line, so I just get rid of everything outside of that zone between M and N. That also gives me a spectral sequence, but it will compute the homotopy of a smaller stunted projective space. So this gives exactly the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence for the stable homotopy groups of R, P, M, N, right? I just keep the cells in that range, I chuck away everything else, and that's what I get. Now the point is, is that these little stunted projective spaces, they enjoy uh, a certain kind of periodicity. So the point is that uh, a stunted projective space like this um, actually arises as a Tom space. So this is, um, it's a Tom space over, sorry, the projective space uh, N minus M for M times the canonical bundle, okay? So this notation here indicates the Tom space for M times L, where L is the, the tautological line bundle over projective space. Uh, and the point is that this uh, M times L for M chosen appropriately actually becomes a stably trivial bundle, which means that this Tom space is just a suspension. Uh, so to say this more precisely, L minus one, so this is a virtual vector bundle. This has finite order in uh, KO zero of this group. And actually, not only have, does it have finite order, you can, you can say what the order is, uh, this is exactly known. It's essentially given by the radon Hurwitz numbers again. I mean, let me not actually spell out the precise numerology, but let me just give you uh, some examples. So this, this outline that I'm giving here is exactly how uh, Mahold explains James periodicity in, I think, what is the shortest published paper I've ever seen. It's like half a page or something like that. Um, but okay, so the, the point of this is that for appropriate M, namely the order of L minus one, uh, this M times L is a stably trivial bundle. And that will tell you that this, this Tom space over here, you know, it's stably, it's just a suspension of that other projective space. So that's where this James periodicity is gonna come from. Uh, and as I said, let me just list some examples rather than do the numbers precisely. So the most basic examples are, oh, we got a pen. If you, uh, if you look at a little stunted projective space that just goes N minus one to N. So this is just two consecutive cells together. Well are either attached or not, depending on the parity of N. Then if you suspend that twice, you just get the next guy, RP N plus one, N plus two, okay? So whenever you take two consecutive lines in the OT, here's the spectral sequence, and you shift that down by two, you're supposed to see the same picture. So this allows you to propagate D1 differentials, which is maybe a bit boring, but nonetheless. So this allows you to propagate D1s throughout the spectral sequence. Um, well, that's not very interesting, but the, the higher periodicities are better. So for example, if you look at stunted projective space of the form N, N minus three. So this is already a little complex with four cells in consecutive dimensions. And this uh, is periodic with period four. So if you suspend it four times, you again get a stunted projective space uh, with the course. So this allows you to already sort of propagate some D2s and some D3s throughout the picture. So that's exactly what was going on in this picture over here. Like for example, these differentials are D2s. And what I was just writing is telling me that these D2s are four periodic. So this, you know, I get, I get this propagation of this little cluster throughout the spectral sequence from this observation. And the next one would be, you know, sigma eight, RPN, N minus seven. So this is already eight consecutive lines. Uh, I, can, I can also make a periodicity for this. And then, uh, et cetera, as I said, to work out the numbers, you need to look at the, the Rodan-Hurwitz numbers for a bit. 
And maybe one remark, which I'll just make in words, it is actually possible to, you know, extend uh, James periodicity also up in that direction. So you can extend the spectral sequence indefinitely also in the vertical direction by looking at uh, RP minus infinity infinity. And that's actually a, that's a fun spectral sequence to study and it's rather bizarre because uh, actually this looks like a huge thing but by the Siegel conjecture RP infinity minus infinity is, is just uh, the suspended sphere spectrum to complete it. So there's tons of sort of ridiculous cancellation going on there which is not today's story. So let me not go into that. Uh, I'll say a bit more about, you know, this comparison to RP, uh, RPM, these stunted projective spaces on, uh, on Thursday as well. Okay, um, but now let me get back to the Goodwillie Tower actually. So this, um, what I was just discussing is essentially the interaction between the EHP sequence and just the very bottom part, the metastable part of the Goodwillie Tower, just P2. Uh, but of course, the, the natural question, if you have the Goodwillie Tower lying around, is how does EHP interact with the entire tower? Like, can you do more? So now we only have this approximation to the EHP sequence in the stable range, but you could hope to do uh, much better in principle by taking into account more and more of the Goodwillie Tower. So that is essentially what, uh, what Behrens did. So there's a, there's a very nice paper by Behrens, which uh, I think it's called the Goodwillie Tower and the EHP sequence. It definitely has Goodwillie and EHP in the title, and it does exactly what I just advertised. So let me try to explain a little bit um, in these last well, roughly 10 minutes of, of how that works. And this will necessarily be quite sketchy, but I'll refer you to his paper to, to learn more. But you should really think of it as the continuation of this Mahold program to the rest of the, the, rest of the Goodwillie Tower. At least um, that's one way to think of it. Um, so I put some notation here. I'm going to write boldface DNx for this spectrum here, uh, of which the usual DN is just uh, the zeroth space. So with this notation, uh, I can state the following. So this proposition is essentially going to summarize the interaction of EHP in the Goodwillie Tower. And this is sort of given the basics of Goodwillie calculus, proving this proposition is rather formal. Like you shouldn't think of this as being uh, particularly hard, but you should think of it as being particularly useful. Uh, so this is sort of the basic starting point for all of Behrens's calculation in that paper. Uh, it says that the EHP sequence refines to towers or to a tower, well, towers of vibration sequences. Um, that look as follows. So I'm going to take L for the dimension of my sphere. So this is P2N of SL. Uh, the E map will take this to loops P2N of SL plus one. And then the H map is gonna to go to loops PN of 2L plus one. And then there's something similar for odd indices. So this looks like this. All right, so there are towers of fiber sequences like this. So one way to sort of summarize this informally is by saying that the Hopf invariant will have uh, the Goodwillie filtration, right? So the Hopf, the Hopf map, or the Hopf, I should say the Hopf invariant has Goodwillie filtration. I mean, you go essentially from 2N to N. That's telling you, I mean, the E, the E map works very well with the Goodwillie Tower. It doesn't really change anything. And then the Hopf map will sort of jump. Um, so you can also immediately deduce uh, what this means for the derivatives in the tower. So for the derivatives, you get uh, in degrees 2n, you get fiber sequences that look like this. All right, so here I get the Hopf map again, going to loops dn of an odd sphere, 2l plus one. And then if I look in the odd dimensions, uh, you actually get the following fiber sequence. So the stabilization map actually gives a, uh, 
Well, here I have to put zero. So for the for these odd guys, the stabilization map actually gives an equivalence on that Goodwillie derivative. And if you think about it for a second, uh, this line actually implies all of these odd layers are going to be contractible, at least too locally. Everything is too local. All right. Okay. So as I said, this this whole thing this summarizes uh, exactly what you need about this interaction. Well, there's some more to say, of course, but this summarizes the interaction between the EHP sequence and the Goodwilling Tower. And that's uh, the starting point for, for Mark's work. Um, one particular consequence of uh, what I just wrote is that, as I was saying, these layers uh, are contractible to locally. Uh, if, well, not only if n is odd, but if n is not a power of two. Okay, so actually, if you look in the Goodwillie Tower, it's only the powers of two uh, that matter. And at all the other steps in the tower, you're not changing anything. So only when n is a power of two do you actually add uh, a layer. There's a corresponding statement here for odd primes. If you're doing, uh, if you're doing odd primary uh, Goodwillie tower, then uh, again, uh, you're only going to see the powers of P. Those are the only non-trivial Goodwillie layers in uh, the Goodwillie tower for a sphere, if the dimension of the sphere is odd. If the sphere is even, then you'll see stuff in dimensions powers of P and twice powers of P. Okay, so it's slightly simpler if you just focus on odd spheres, which at odd primes you could do anyway, because even spheres just split as products of odd spheres, so, you know. Okay, so this power of p thing is 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 not specific to the prime of two clearly. Um, okay, so the interesting layers are the are the powers of two. Now let me state some facts about these layers. So a lot is known about these layers, uh, and I, I guess I'll return to this on Thursday as well. But for now, uh, let me just state uh, some general facts. The first one is uh, the homology of these layers is completely known. So, homology of the layer two, the KSL with coefficients in F2 with Steenrod operations and everything, this was computed by Aron Mahold. And actually, if you look in Behrens' paper, he gives a reinterpretation of this calculation or of the result of the calculation. Uh, he gives an interpretation in terms of power operations. So this is also the beginning of a whole little industry, which maybe I'll say a bit more about next time. So this, it gives an interpretation in terms of power operations for, um, well, the operad given by the derivatives of the identity. So I only told you about these derivatives of the identity as a sequence of spectra, but it turns out Michael Chink proved that these naturally carry the structure of an operat. So whenever you have such an operat in spectra, you get an associated theory of homology operations on the homology of algebras for that operat. And that's exactly what's going on. So they're sort of Dyer-Lashoff-like. So this is um, much like Dyer-Lashoff operations. In the homology of E infinity ring spectra. You think of it as analogous to that. Okay, so this operat, I should mention this has a name. This is actually what's usually called the spectral Lie operat. As I said, I'll, I'll return to this. But it's, it's really a stable homotopy theory incarnation of the Lie operat. Um, now, if you really want to learn something about these Goodwillie layers of the identity, then uh, the place to go other than Ron Mahold is this paper by Ron Dwyer. Uh, it's another really wonderful paper. Uh, they show lots of things in this paper. Um, they, give, they make several very important connections, but one thing they do is they show that after uh, two localization, uh, let's say L is odd, uh, these, these Goodwillie layers of the identity on an odd sphere they can be identified in terms of familiar spectra. And I've, well, 
familiar depending on whether you are familiar with them or not, but at least previously studied spectra like from the 80s by, by Mitchell and Pretty that came up in a different context, namely studying symmetric products of spheres. So they showed that this thing is equivalent to the spectrum or a suspension of the spectrum that's usually called LK sub L. Um, so let me just state what this spectrum is, but I'll, I'll just I'll give a few examples in a second. But this spectrum, as I said, it's studied by Mitchell and Pretty. It really arises from uh, a Tom space again. So I can look at the classifying space B of F2 to the K and look at the Tom space associated to L times the reduced regular representation. Okay, so this row here is the reduced regular representation. And now it turns out, well, you can do a certain thing to this. You can hit this with what's called the Steinberg idempotent. So this is the Steinberg idempotent in the group ring of the, the general linear group of F2, which acts, uh, which acts on this thing over here, which acts on this whole situation. Anyway, if you're familiar with this, then great. If you're not familiar with this, it's not so important at this, at this stage. The point is that these are spectra that uh, are well studied. Like they have been studied since the 80s and we know lots of things about them. Okay, so these were stu studied by Mitchell Pretty already, as I said. These are very, it's a very interesting family of spectra and it's very interesting to see that they come up naturally uh, out of the Goodwill Tower. All right, so let me just uh, iterate um, the basic examples of these LKs. These L0 is the easiest for any little L. This is just the sphere spectrum. And then these L1s, um, so these are just these stunted projector spaces that I was talking about before. And so for higher values of K, you get uh, also things that you should think of as having to do with classifying spaces of finite groups. Uh, but okay, I mean, the formulas get a little bit more complicated. They turn into what I wrote over here. Um, okay, so let me, um, okay, I have two minutes. So let me say this uh, rather briefly. So a consequence of what I've been saying before. So this, this fiber sequence on uh, the level of the derivatives that I gave in this proposition gives fiber sequences, can just essentially rewrite the proposition in terms of these LKLs. This is, if you think about it, this is just more or less a rewriting, but different notation. And this reproduces uh, some fiber sequences that were studied earlier by Poon and uh, Takayasu. The whole point of this is that this gives an inductive method of understanding these LKs, right? According to this fibrous sequence like this, like these LKs, they are, they admit filtrations where the associated graded are LK minus ones. So you can sort of inductively try to work your way up and start understanding these various Goodwillie layers. And that's, a, that's exactly the basis for uh, Behrens's program. So this program, essentially this calculation in this paper consists of three steps. So the first is, the first step is to understand uh, all these LKNs. So essentially you start with this atiyah hirsuk spectral sequence that we already had going from the stable homotopy groups of spheres to the stable homotopy groups of these L1s. So this is just the atiyah hirsuk spectral sequence for RP infinity that we already discussed. Um, but you can continue using these cofiber sequences I had on the previous page. There are spectral sequences going from the homotopy of these guys to the homotopy of the L2s. Okay, etc. So there's really a sequence of spectral sequences here that ends up computing the homotopy groups of LKL. Right, so it's essentially N of them, uh, K of them, I guess. So once you understand these guys, the next thing you want to do is you want to understand the Goodwillie spectral sequence. So 
So this is a spectral sequence that starts from, well, the homotopy groups of these layers, as I was saying, those layers are these LKs or the LKLs. It's a spectral sequence that has E1 page given by those stable homotopy groups and going to the unstable homotopy groups of the L sphere. And then the last step of this program is to, well, try to understand the EHP spectral sequence which goes from the homotopy groups of these L spheres to the stable homotopy groups spheres. Right, so this is really a lot of spectral sequences and sequences of spectral sequences are generally a bad idea. So really what Mark does is he somehow puts all these things together into one big spectral sequence, but you have to index on not just the natural numbers, but you have to start playing with ordinals and really make this a big transfinite spectral sequence, if you will. So this is going to be a transfinite spectral sequence that starts with the stable homotopy groups of spheres and ends at the stable homotopy groups of spheres, which sounds a little ridiculous, but somehow it is not. Like understanding that spectral sequence is telling you everything about, um, well, if you understand it, the EHP spectral sequence. Okay, and you can really play these points two and three off of one another. Like the P map tells you about differentials here and it's kind of hard, whereas the P map here is actually pretty easy to understand in that spectral sequence. So playing all of this stuff off of one another really gives you an effective calculational scheme, which is what Mark does. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, on behalf of